Thank you for the introduction, and I'd like to thank the conference organizers for inviting me to talk today. Um, I'm going to talk to you about some work that I did at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln in the research group of Tim Gay, and I'd like to start off by acknowledging the funding that we received from the National Science Foundation. Uh, just a brief outline of what I'll be talking about. First, I'll introduce the term chirality. Our previous speaker, of course, gave a very nice introduction for this, but just in case there's people who are joining us, I'm still going to go over this information. For those of you that were here, you can have your after lunch siesta. Just please make sure you wake up for the rest of the talk. Um, I'll talk about the implications that arise due to the symmetry breaking associated with chirality. I'll first talk about this in terms of polarized light. These effects tend to be a little bit more common and perhaps more well understood. I'll use these effects to introduce the type of effects that I, in particular, was interested in when spin polarized electrons interact with chiral molecules. I'll talk about the experiments that I worked on and present the results of these experiments. First, I'll talk about the transmission of spin polarized electrons through chiral molecules. And then I'll talk about a dissociative electron attachment process between spin polarized electrons and chiral molecules, in which case the electron sets up a temporary negative ion resonance in the molecule, and the molecule breaks apart. I will then present some new data that we just recently took looking at the dissociative electron attachment in various halocamphor molecules. We took this data in order to help illuminate the mechanisms responsible for the asymmetries and the interactions between the spin polarized electrons and chiral molecules. So what is chirality? Objects which are chiral are mirror images of one another, but non-superimposable. So your hands give a perfect illustration of this. Your left hand is a mirror image of your right hand, but you can't take your right hand and position it in any sort of way such that you're able to exactly reproduce your left hand. Chiral molecules are a type of optical stereoisomer. And we, refer, we use the term enantiomer to refer to one of the two chiralities. The right-handed form of the molecule we refer to as the right enantiomer, and the left-handed form we call the left enantiomer. Uh, if we have a mixture of equal amounts of the two different chiralities, then the mixture is said to be racemic. And such a mixture would ob obviously have no net chirality. Electrons can also be considered to be chiral. The way that we determine the chirality of the electron is by pointing our thumb in the direction of propagation and curling the fingers in the direction of the spin. So as you can see, the electron on the right matches up with your right hand. Electron on the left matches up with your left hand. We call the right-handed electron a positive holistic electron. Sometimes we also call it a spin-off electron. And the left-handed electron is a negative Felicity electron or a spin-down electron. An interesting observation when considering many biological molecules is that many of them exist in only one chirality. So for example, all monosaccharides, which include blood sugars, so glucose, fructose, and galactose, and common sugar, sucrose, exist naturally in only a right-handed form. All amino acids occur naturally in only a left-handed form. Now, the exact reason for why we see this biological homochirality is unknown. However, one of the theories that helps to explain it is known as the vester ulbricht hypothesis. Now, in the generally accepted way that life began on Earth is that prebiotic ponds of water were struck by lightning. This imparted energy into the system and created the biological precursors for life. However, conservation of parity dictates that such electrochemical interactions in such a process are symmetric. This means that equal amounts of the left and the right biological precursors would be formed. 
The weak force, however, is known to not conserve parity. And it is the weak force that is responsible for beta radiation, which produces electrons of only one chirality. So the vester ulbricht model says that the chiral electrons produced in beta radiation came down and preferentially destroyed one of the two enantiomers of the biological precursors for life. Now, in order to introduce the effects, I'd like to talk a bit about the way that spin polarized, or sorry, circularly polarized light interacts with chiral molecules. The first type of effect that I'd like to talk about is known as natural optical activity or circular birefringence. In this situation, light of opposite helicities experience a, a different value for the real part of the index of refraction for the material. Therefore, if linearly polarized light passes through the material, the plane of polarization is rotated. This is very analogous to the Faraday effect, which many undergraduate labs look at. But in the Faraday effect, a magnetic field has to be applied to the sample in order to induce the optical activity. For chiral molecules, this effect occurs naturally. No magnetic field is needed. And that is why it's referred to as natural optical activity. The second type of effect is known as circular dichroism. And in this situation, light of opposite circular polarizations experience a different value for the imaginary part of the index of refraction for the material. Therefore, the two different circular polarizations are, have, one of the two experiences a preferential absorption. So in the example shown here, as you can see, the left circular polarized light is, tr is absorbed much stronger by the material than the right circular polarized light. So the first type of electron molecule experiment that I'd like to talk about is electron circular dichroism. And this is, of course, very analogous to the optical circular dichroism. However, instead of having light of opposite helices being preferentially transmitted through the chiral sample, we're now dealing with spin polarized electrons. We define the asymmetry in the transmission of spin polarized electrons through the chiral sample as the positive helicity current minus the negative helicity current divided by the sum of the two. So for the example shown here, more negative helicity electrons are transmitted through, so our asymmetry is obviously going to take on a negative sign. So here is the schematic of the apparatus that I used to perform the experiments looking at the interactions between spin polarized electrons and chiral molecules. It, it consisted of three different chambers. We have a source chamber, differential pumping chamber, and a target chamber. Each chamber had a turbo pump. Source chamber also had an ion pump on it. Uh, our source of spin polarized electrons is a gallium arsenide photocathode. And just the basic idea of how gallium arsenide works, you can basically think about it as a glorified photoelectric effect. We take a gallium arsenide photocathode, specially prepare it, and then we shine circularly polarized light on the uh, crystal. The spin polarization of the electrons that are emitted from the gallium arsenide crystal is determined by the circular polarization of the light that we are using for the photo emission. So it's very easy for us to reverse the spin polarization of our electron beam simply by reversing the circular polarization of our incident light. The spin polarized electrons are emitted from the gallium arsenide crystal. They leave the source chamber and enter the differential pumping chamber. They're guided around a bend in the differential pumping chamber by solenoidal magnets. And the electrons then enter the target chamber. It's in the target chamber that we introduce our target molecules, our chiral molecules. Uh, also in the target chamber, we can perform optical polarimetry measurements to measure the polarization of our electron beam. We have an optical polarimeter that sits off the back end of the apparatus. And typical electron polarizations for our bulk gallium arsenide crystals are around 30% spin polarization. 
This is a schematic of the uh, crucial elements in the target chamber. We have various electron optic elements which help us shape the electron beam. The electron beam enters the target cell, which is where we introduce our chiral molecules. And the current, the transmitted current is then directed out and collected on a Faraday cup. It is this current collected on the Faraday cup that we use to determine our asymmetries when we are doing transmission experiments. Here are the results for the data that I collected for the transmission of spin polarized electrons through chiral bromocamphor, with bromocamphor given by the formula shown here. The black data is the data taken by Kessler's group, and my data is the red and the blue data. The difference between the red and the blue data is we reversed our quarter wave plate, which does a circular polarization of our laser light that we use for photo emission. This introduces an overall phase shift in our experiment. And if we're measuring a true chiral asymmetry, then the sign of the asymmetry should reverse when we make this change. As you can see, the red data is plotted with the opposite sign of what we measured, just purely to give a better an easier comparison to Kessler's data. The next type of experiment that I like to talk about is a dissociative electron attachment process. In this situation, uh, we're again using bromocamphor molecules. And the electron comes in, sets up a temporary negative ion resonance with the bromocamphor, also shown here. And then the molecule breaks apart with the negative charge of the instant electron being retained by one fragment. For bromocamphor, it's retained by the bromine uh, anion that is broken off. Uh, as I have previously mentioned, our, we apply a magnetic field to our apparatus. So if we consider what's happening in this situation, the current is interacting with the chiral molecules. Trans scattered el uh, electrons are primarily directed out of the target cell by the magnetic field. However, because of the heavier mass of the bromine anions, they are able to cross the magnetic field lines, and they are detected as a negative current on the inner target cell walls. The question that we wanted to answer was that if we're using chiral uh, bromocamphor in spin polarized electrons, do we produce more bromine anions for electrons of one spin than the other? Here are the results that I got for the dissociative electron attachment in bromocamphor. The top graph shows the anion current that we detected as a function of instant electron energy. And the bottom graph shows the asymmetry that we measured as a function of energy in this dissociative electron attachment current. Uh, again, the difference between the red and the blue data is this instrumental check. The sign of the asymmetry flips just as we would hope that it was, helping to ensure that we're measuring a true chiral asymmetry and not just in some instrumental effect. Uh, a second experimental check that we did was we created a mixture of racemic bromocamphor, equal amounts of the two different chiralities, so therefore no net chirality. Such a sample should not exhibit an asymmetry. And as you can see, the data that we collected for the racemic bromocamphor is consistent with zero. These results are very important because they show that we are having an asymmetric molecular breakup that is dependent on the electron helicity. This is important in terms of the vester ulbricht model, which requires that molecules of different chiralities are broken up at different rates based on the instant electron spin. So these results are great, and we were very excited to get them. But there are a lot of questions remaining as to the exact origins of these asymmetries. Our results are certainly permitted by symmetry, 
But what are the actual dynamics responsible for the asymmetry that we're measuring? There are three different theories that explain the origins of asymmetries between spin polarized electrons and chiral molecules. We refer to these theories as mop plural scattering, spin other orbit coupling, and helicity di dynamics. I will talk about each of these three mechanisms in terms of dissociative electron attachment. The first theory is the mop plural scattering. In this situation, the incident electron first coulombically scatters off of one of the atoms in the molecule. This introduces some transverse spin in the electron spin direction. And because of the transverse spin, the electrons are then able to mot scatter off of the heavy atom in the molecule. In mot scattering, the direction of uh, scattering is determined by the electron spin. So we'll say that electrons of one spin are deflected upwards and electrons of the other spin are deflected downwards. These electrons are then able to set up resonances with other atoms in the molecule. For an achiral molecule, meaning not chiral, the, distribu the average distribution of atoms in the molecule is symmetric. Therefore, the electrons of both spins will have atoms that they are able to interact with. However, for a chiral molecule, the distribution of atoms in the molecule is not symmetric. Therefore, for example, the electrons of this spin would not have an atom to interact with and set up a resonance to create a dissociative electron attachment process. The second theory is known as spin other orbit coupling. And in this situation, the approaching electron induces a magnetic moment in the target molecule. The direction of this magnetic moment is determined by the target molecule's chirality. And the magnetic moment of this uh, target molecule interacts with the spin of the projectile electron. Electrons of one spin will be deflected more strongly than electrons of the opposite spin. The electrons that aren't deflected strongly are more likely to interact with the molecule. The final theory is known as the helicity density dynamics. In this situation, spin orbit interactions between the electrons in the target molecule and the heavy atoms in the target molecule give an average non-zero helicity for the electrons of the target molecule. This helicity is dependent on the molecule's chirality. So if we have an instant electron, if the helicity of the instant electron matches up with the helicity of the target molecule, then it's more likely to set up resonance in the molecule well, whereas electrons of the other helicity will just pass on by and not interact. There are three important parameters in determining how the size of the asymmetry is going to scale based on these three different theories. The first parameter is alpha, the fine structure constant. The second is eta, which is a parameter to, to gauge the chirality of the target structure. And the final is z, the atomic number of the heavy atom in the molecule. For both the mop plural scattering and the helicity de density dynamics, the size of the asymmetry should scale as z squared. However, for the spin other orbit coupling, there is no explicit z dependence in how the asymmetry is going to scale. So as you can see, we have very basic, ba very basic uh, concepts are not understood as to how the size of the asymmetry is going to scale when we vary our target molecule. So what we wanted to do was look at some variations of our chiral molecules and see what happens to the size of the asymmetry when we make substitutions in the molecule. As I have previously mentioned, the molecule that we were using was the bromocamphor, as shown here. 
what the first thing that we wanted to do was to replace the bromine ion or bromine atom with an iodine atom. If the theories that say that the asymmetry should scale as z squared are correct, then we should get an enhancement uh, in the size of our asymmetry of almost a factor of four. The second thing that we wanted to do was to move the heavy atom in the molecule. So we wanted to look at the three configuration of iodocamphor, where iodine is nice and close to the chiral center of the molecule. And then look at 10 iodocamphor, where the iodine is moved farther away from the chiral center of the molecule. So here are the results that we got for the dissociative electron attachment in these various halocamphor compounds. Um, for the three iodocamphor, as you can see, the size of the asymmetry did grow. In fact, it's very close to that factor of four enhancement that we were expecting. However, there are some peculiarities in this data. As you can see, for the three bromocamphor, the sign of the asymmetry reverses. For the three iodocamphor, we don't see this. We're very confused by this right now. We don't have an explanation as to why one set it would show a reverse in the sign of the asymmetry and the other would not. We then looked at the 10 iodocamphor, where we moved the iodine far away from the chiral center. And one might expect that if you're moving the iodine, the heavy atom, away from the chiral center of the molecule, then it's not really going to be significantly contributing to the asymmetry. Therefore, our asymmetry should be smaller. However, as you can see, this is not the case. We measured asymmetries that, by our standards, are quite giant, uh, about 20 times 10 to the minus 4. Again, this is something that, at the current stage, we, are not, we don't have a good explanation as to why it's significantly larger for the 10 iodocamphor than for the 3 iodocamphor. So in conclusion, I'd just like to summarize our results. We were able to confirm the results for the transmission of spin-polarized electrons through chiral bromocamphor as measured by the group of Kessler. We have also detected a chirally sensitive asymmetric molecular breakup in dissociative electron attachment. These results are very important in terms of the vester ulbricht hypothesis, which says that molecules of one chirality are preferentially destroyed by spin-polarized electrons. And we have also taken some data with systematic variations of our molecules in order to help illuminate the origin or the uh, mechanisms responsible for the chiral asymmetries. At this point, I would like to thank the people who contributed to this work. My graduate advisor, Tim Gay, from the University of Nebraska. Also, Paul Burrow, also from University of Nebraska, contributed to many aspects of this work. Frank Lewis from Northumbria University synthesized the iodocamphor compounds that we used for the latter experiments. And Jeff Mills from the Air Force Research Laboratory has recently become involved in aspects of this work. And at this time, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh -huh.